So thank you for coming today. And as Tamar said, we are doing the program Inspiration Between Sorrow and Consolation. Last week I talked about the weeks, the three weeks preceding Tisha B'Av. Today I'll be talking about Tisha B'Av and next week I'll be speaking about the um, seven weeks of consolation. So as you see here, there are three images. Each of those images are images I created for the Haftarot concerning those uh, bits of time. So the Haftarah at the top, the image at the top is for the Haftarah uh, called Nachamu and it, was be, it will be read um, as a Haftarah of comfort after Tisha B'Av. On the bottom left is an image for a Haftarah during the three weeks and on the right is the Haftarah for the reading of Shacharit on Tisha B'Av. So I did these images for Haftarot for a Haftorah scroll that was commissioned by uh, Beth David, a synagogue in Toronto, and I painted each of these images right into the Haftarah scroll, and it's used every week. The images were put together with explanation into a book called Illuminations. These two images are the images for the two Haftarot of Tisha B'Av, the top one for Shacharit, the bottom one for Mincha. And the top shows Jeremiah or Yermiyahu's despair, the bottom one shows Isaiah or Yeshiyahu's hope. We're in the midst of the nine days and traditionally people don't listen to music, they remove themselves from joyousness. So no meat, if you like eating meat, no parties, weddings, you don't do your laundry, don't attend plays and don't go to live entertainment. So all of these things are semi-mourning, getting, because we're thinking about those days of, of, of Tisha B'Av. So today we'll go through a short history of Tisha B'Av, We'll look at the readings, the lamentations written by um, Jeremiah, Yermiyahu, called Echa in Hebrew, and the two Haftarot that we read on the day of Tisha B'Av. We'll look at art that illustrates the readings and talk about the backgrounds of some of the artists. So Tisha B'Av commemorates the destruction of the first and second temples. Both tragedies occurred on the 9th of Av. It's a terrible, terrible day in our history. The first destruction, uh, Jews were exiled to Babylon, and that was in 586 before the Common Era. The second destruction was in the year 70 at the hands of the Romans. Also on Tisha B'Av, on the 9th of Av, in 1290, the Jews were expelled from England and in 1492, they were expelled from Spain. And the first mass deportation of Jews from the Warsaw Ghetto also happened on the 9th of Av. The Romans, in their pride, bragged about this by building what was traditionally done, an arch of triumph, an arc of triumph. And this arch was put on the highest point of the main street of Rome on the Sacra Via, the main processional street. And, <clears throat> excuse me, when you look at the arch, the way it's created, that relief is brilliant because the viewer looks at it and they feel they are there. And how did the Romans do that? The form goes in a curve. So figures and you see them three-quarter view as, as if you're watching a parade. They come out of the stone, closer, closer towards you, and then back into the stone. The figures behind that are farther from you are flatter in that relief. And you see the menorah that they're carrying from Jerusalem, from the temple. 
and the other kalim, the um, objects that were taken from the temple that are being carried back to Rome. And the people carrying them, some of them are Jewish slaves. So it's a difficult day, a day of deep pain. We were exiled in the year 70. For 2,000 years, we longed for Jerusalem and Israel, and we wondered if we would ever have our land again. Three weeks, and we wondered when we would have our temple back. So for three weeks, without music or joyful gatherings, that all lessens our joy. The evening of Tisha B'Av, we read Echa, or Lamentations, and the next day we read two Haptarot, one by Jeremiah, one by Isaiah. This is a painting of the prophet Jeremiah done by Chagall in 1968. And you might remember from that last week, Chagall did lots of pictures of Jeremiah. And here he is holding his book, Echa, with the angel watching him. And he's looking so sadly with the sun and the moon over him and the destruction of Jerusalem behind him and he had to leave. And you see that in the bottom left-hand corner, it says Yermiyahu. So the book of Yermiyahu was written after the destruction of the first temple of Jerusalem. And we don't know if it was written in Jerusalem or in Egypt. Um, Yermiyahu, Jeremiah had wanted to stay in Jerusalem. God had said, Jews stay in Jerusalem, but guards from the place where he was staying, Jewish guards, grabbed him and forced him and his friend Baruch, the scribe, to go to Egypt. So um, we don't know whether it was written in Jerusalem or in Egypt, but we do know it was after the destruction. The imagery in Echa is chilling. The words in the Haftarah are painful and stark. We read Eicha in the evening, sitting on the ground in darkness with a candle on the ground for light and sung to a mournful tune, which is called a trop in Hebrew. And it's done in a minor key, not in a joyful major key. The word Eicha oh, and um, this is Jeremiah crying, The Lamentations of Yermiyahu by Mark Chagall. Uh, he did it in his Bible series that he created between 1931, 1931 and 1939. He was actually, he went to Israel with his wife, Bella, to look at Jerusalem. Uh, Vollard, the, co the collector and um, art dealer, had asked him to do a Bible, Bible series. But back to... Um, Echa. Echa means how, or how is it possible? Alas, how is this possible? And you see that it has the same letters as Ayeka. Ayeka is the word on the top. Ayeka is the word on the bottom. Ayeka is what Hashem said when he went to the Garden of Eden after Adam and Chava, Adam and Eve, ate of the forbidden fruit. So they ate the forbidden fruit, and they knew that God was coming, and they hid. And God said, Ayeka, where are you? Or why are you hiding from me? So here, talking about the destruction, Yermiyahu is asking that question of Hashem both, how is this possible? And why are you hiding from me? Yermiyahu is asking God, why are you hiding from me? The first four chapters of Echa are written as an acrostic. Every single line, every single verse starts with a different letter of the alphabet, going from Aleph to Bet to Gimel to Dalit, 
all the way through the alphabet. Chapters 1, 2, and 4 each have 22 letters. That's the number of letters in the alphabet. And each of those three chapters goes through and the first line starts with the appropriate letter of the alphabet. Chapter 3 actually has 66 verses. It uses each letter three times. So the first three lines start with Aleph. Lines 4, 5, and 6 start with Bet. And it continues. It's a book of poetry. Ayecha, Eicha, or Lamentations, is a book of poetry. Five chapters, five different laments. And the, using the alphabet indicates two things. It indicates that Yirmiyahu, Jeremiah, didn't just write it quickly. He really sat and thought. He had to think about what he was doing. He had to measure his words to create it in such a poetic way. And going through the entire alphabet from Aleph to Tav shows completeness. It is complete destruction, complete abandonment, complete loss, and complete failure of the Jews by enacting all the sins. In chapters 2, 3, and 4, the verses that start with Ayin and Pe are reversed. The Pe, the letters are supposed to be Ayin followed by Pe, but in those three chapters, the Pe is first. The Pe is followed by the Ayin. And what do Pe and Ayin mean? Ayin means I. And if you look at the bottom cursive letters, it, if you turn it on its side, you can imagine that it's an I. Pe, pe, pe means mouth. And if you use your imagination, you can imagine that that is a face with a mouth. So why would these letters have been reversed? It was a warning. It was a thought. Realizing that a person should look and weigh and judge what they are seeing before they speak. What happens is people, they don't look and measure and weigh. They listen to what someone else has to say. They listen to um, a rumor and they repeat it. So they don't look first, they talk first. And this is a problem that we have throughout history. We have it today. People see things or read things on the internet. They get things from the media. The media itself, which people trust, they don't look on the ground themselves they listen to what someone else says, and then they report it. And this creates all kinds of problems. So by reversing the ayin and the pe, Jeremiah was saying, you did wrong. This is wrong. You used your mouth. You spread rumors. You didn't look for the truth. But if we're going to have the truth, if we're going to have feeling, you have to use your eyes first and make judgments. Chapter 3 is the pivotal chapter in the book. It's the middle chapter. And the ayin and the pe, in that, oh, sorry, in that particular verse actually refers to speech. So it says, Patsu alenu pihem kol oivenu. They rail against us. Their mouths are our enemies. And then with the ayin, it refers to eyes, and it says, My eyes shall flow without ceasing. 
So looking at the meaning of each of the chapters, most of the chapters start with the word Echa. Many of the chapters start with the word, three of them start with Echa. And Jerusalem is described as a poor widow. And she's also always, Jerusalem is always referred to in the feminine. Jerusalem, in this case, is referred to as a, a widow, a woman who was once um, regal and is now destitute. As a widow, she has no means of support. She has no um, husband. Jerusalem and Israel were seen as a bride and bridegroom. And now she's a widow because Hashem has left. And her enemies are now her masters. In this verse, Jerusalem is taking responsibility for what has happened and admits that Jerusalem is miserable, but she has sinned. So Echa, alas, lonely sits the city once great with people. She that was once great with people has become like a widow. And this picture is from, um, it, it's a woodcut of the expulsion from Frankfurt. And um, what I did is I wrote down expulsions of Jews from throughout time, starting with 586 BCE um, with the expulsion of Jews from Judea to 70 CE, the expulsions of the Jews and the destruction of the temple from Judea, going through to Greece and Jerusalem, Alexandria, France, Spain, Italy, over and over and over again. And what I want to mention about that is also on the morning of Tisha B'Av, in many congregations and many uh, places, we read Kinot. Those are poems of sorrow that look back at the terrible things that happened to Jews over the centuries. And we read these poor poems of sorrow that were written to memorialize them. Here in chapter 1, verse 9, it says, How the enemy jeers. So, what I have done, and what you'll see throughout the presentation, is that I take illustrations, I take paintings, woodcuts, imagery that has been created, that have been created by Jews throughout time, and show them because they illustrate the words, the sad words, the devastating words of Echa. A lot of the imagery, most of the imagery, is from the Shoah, not because the Shoah was worse than the um, Spanish Inquisition or other things that happened to Jews so long ago, but because we have a record. And that record is quite large and it does indicate what happened and gives us that look right at what was going on. So here we see a man and his wife and his son walking down a street. And as it says how the enemies jeer, we see these people jeering at the Jews who are not allowed to walk on the sidewalk and not allowed to look at their enemies. And Hashem is the judge. This is a print by an artist named Fred Bedrich Frita. He lived from 1906 to 1944, and he supervised a drawing workshop in Theresienstadt. He illustrated supplements for the reports that had to be sent to the commandant's, the SS commandant's um, office. He did a lot of drawings while he was there. And you see the V on top of the roof. That is a show of independence. It's the V for victory. Um, there's a woman who's sitting on a box with an X and a 482. And we see a lot of numbers in Bedrich Frita's 
works, and I think it refers to all of the suitcases that were taken away and labeled, and the goods were stolen, of course. This piece is called Life and Death in the Yard, and it says all her inhabitants sigh as they search for bread. So, um, Bedra Frita, like many of the other artists in the workshops there, did a lot of drawing and printmaking in their spare time. And when the, the SS officers discovered that he was doing these drawings, they sent him to Auschwitz, where he perished. This is work by Felix Nussbaum. Also, they have bartered their treasures for food. Food is often mentioned throughout Eicha, how there is no food, the children are starving, the parents are starving, people are searching for food. And this painting by Felix Nussbaum, he lived from 1904 to 1944. He was a surrealist artist. His work was very, very fine. He was um, arrested once, but he managed to escape and went into hiding in Brussels, where he continued to paint. And um, he painted his memories of life in the camp. He was in the camp in 1940, and the realities of life as a Jew. And he was on the last transport to Auschwitz and was killed. This is a drawing, and I put, called it my, used the uh, phrase, the pasuk, my children are forlorn as the foe has prevailed. And I put beside it the famous book, I Never Saw Another Butterfly, poems by children from Theresienstadt, and this is um, the cover that has a drawing of um, one of the, that one of the children put in. And the children were forlorn, like she never saw another butterfly. And the poems and drawings show both hope and sadness. Uh, Bedrich Frita, who did those previous drawings, had a son named Tommy. And while he was in the camp in Theresienstadt, he made a book for Tommy's birthday. And I think the book is now in Yad Vashem. His son, Tommy, survived. And Bedr Frita's friend, who was in Theresienstadt with him, Leo Haas, survived and adopted Tommy as his own. So here is the prophet Jeremiah. And in chapter 1, verse 16, it says, For these things do I weep, my eyes flow with tears. Alas, the Lord in his wrath has, shunned, has shamed fair Zion. He cast down from heaven to earth the majesty of Israel. And this sentence, beginning with Echa, is the start of chapter 2. And this is also where the acrostic of the ayin and the pei are switched. And in this book, God is acting like an adversary. The, it's told very matter-of-factly. And in chapter 2, in verses 1 to 9, there are just one after another descriptions of the things that God has done has acted in blazing anger, has shamed Israel, cast down, did not remember, laid waste, without pity, raised, brought low in dishonor, withdraw, withdrew his right hand, ravaged, bent his blow like the enemy, slew, poured out his wrath, acted like a foe, destroyed, stripped his booth, destroyed his tabernacle, has spurned in raging anger, rejected, disdained, handed over to the foe, resolved to destroy, bringing destruction, smashed her down. The prophets received no vision. So in verses 1 to 9, 
there are 28 descriptions of God's anger. And one of the things that inter is interesting is that it doesn't say, God, you were wrong. It just describes all the things that God did and the resultant suffering. So this is a picture by Francesco Hayes, who lived from 1791 to 1882. And this is one of those um, awful pictures of the destruction of the Temple of Jerusalem. And in chapter 2, it says, laid waste all her citadels, destroyed all her strongholds, and handed over to the foe the walls to her citadel. And in verse 17, it says, Hashem has fulfilled uh, his word. So God is our enemy in this chapter, and like an enemy has spurned us, there is no consolation. Jerusalem and the Jews are betrayed and lonely. And how does Jerusalem look staring at her situation? And here he has ravaged Jacob like flaming fire, consuming on all sides. This is a woodcut from Nuremberg. You see, can see some of the triangular Jew hats in there the enemy bringing wood to burn them. It's pretty horrifying, and it actually happened. So this is from the bird's head Haggadah. The pasuk, my eyes are spent with tears, my heart is in tumult, my being melts away over the ruin of my poor people. And we see here an image from Tzav, a, one of the Haftarot, where Jeremiah wrote the Haftarah, the, the Haftarahs from Jeremiah's words. And that image is inspired by the Bird's Head Haggadah, which was written sometime, written and illustrated. It's the first illustrated Haggadah that we have from southern Germany, done sometime between 1290 and 1300. And at that time, there were crusaders going through southern Germany. When people heard, when Jews heard that the crusaders were coming, they knew that they were going to be killed. Their children might be killed or might be taken, converted to um, Christianity and made into slaves. So rather than have their children converted to become Christians and slaves, parents, if they couldn't hide, quickly enough, they often killed their children. And here, their eyes were filled with tears. On the right-hand side of the Haftorah image, we see Aharon and Moshe, Aaron and Moses, calling to God, asking God to intervene for the people. And there, in the image, we see Abraham, Abraham sacrificing Isaac. So this is Akedat Yitzchak, the sacrifice of Isaac. The angel is stopping the sword. And the people in southern Germany identified with the pain of Abraham. How could they sacrifice their own child? But maybe they will have to. These are woodcuts of infanticides that were in Haggadot. One is from the, the Venice Haggadah of 1609, one from the Mantua Haggadah of 1560, and one from the Prague Haggadah of 1526. The um, Yishma Hashem et Kolenu, and God will, they will call out to God to hear our voice. And it says the babes and sucklings language, languish in the squares of the city. So the reason this image was put into Haggadot was sort of to put a, turn it on its head because there were blood libels at the time. And the blood libels were that 
Jews were taking babies and taking their blood to make matzot or to do whatever else with the blood. And of course that wasn't happening. So to turn that horrible accusation on its head, um, the woodcuts were made and the Romans or the Egyptians were killing Jewish babies and using the blood for Pharaoh to bathe in to heal himself of leprosy. So that is that image. And again, the children are asking, where's the bread and wine? And we have in those words of Jeremiah, vision and sound. And it says, your breach is great like the sea, and the sea also is sound. So Yermiyahu, Jeremiah, is trying to bring all of our feelings into the words. Prostrate on the streets lie young and old. The virgins and young men are fallen by the sword. And it goes on and says, all your enemies, they jeer at you and they gnash your teeth. And the description of the dead maidens and the elders betrayed by all her friends. So in chapter three, it doesn't begin, the phrase doesn't begin with um, echa. It begins with, I am the man who has known affliction under the rod of his wrath. And this is the man who has known affliction and who is talking about it himself. Again, a lot of very strong descriptors are used uh, to describe God's actions. It says, under the rod of his wrath, um, drove on and on, unrelieved darkness, brings down his hand, worn away my flesh and skin, shattered my bones, uh, built misery and hardship around me, made me dwell in darkness, walled me in, shuts out my prayers, made my paths a maze, a lurking bear to me, a lion in hiding. He mangled me, left me numb, I am a target of his arrow. He broke my teeth on gravel and ground me in the dust. So this time there are 24 descriptions in the first 21 uh, verses. This picture is a woodcut by um, Carl Fleischmann. Carl Fleischmann was a doctor. He was a Renaissance man who lived from 1897 to 1944. He also was in Theresienstadt, where he did many, many drawings, woodcuts, paintings. But he was a doctor. As I said, I think I said a Renaissance man. He wrote poetry, he wrote plays, he wrote books. He drew, he painted, and he was an amazing doctor. His specialty was taking care of the older people. Um, he secretly documented life in the ghetto in his drawings and writings, and his works were hidden in the ghetto and found after the war. So he begins a Nihagi war. It shifts perspective, and it might be every man, a Nihagi Bor, or it might be Yermiyahu himself. So I am the man who has witnessed destruction. It starts out with the description of desperate conditions, frustration with God, confronting the experience and confronting God. Where is God and why is God punishing me? And then goes to the public at large. This is a drawing by Bedrich Frita, uh, Frederick Bedrich Frita, um, the name is misspelled, in the living quarters. And it says, he has made me dwell in darkness like those long dead. Um, and how all that was beautiful and fine is rich and degraded. 
So they call to Hashem, they describe their desolation, and call to him to remember them and their former glory. And here, Bedrich Frita again says, I'm walled in. I am set as a mark for the arrow. I cry out, no one can hear me. I am filled with bitterness. I am the sufferer. And here is Felix Nussbaum, who was in hiding for four years. So he was in a camp for a number of months, and this is his memory of being in the camp. And you can see those figures in the back, half naked, and this one just bent over. And on the right-hand side, self-portrait in a shroud. So this is him with three of the people who were staying with him. And you can see he's holding a rope as if there's a noose around his neck. Another drawing by Carl Fleischmann, you have made us filth and refuse in the midst of the people. So <clears throat> it goes on, you have clothed yourself in anger and pursued us, screened yourself with a cloud that no prayer may pass through. That's a very interesting image to, because when you think of it, the Mishkan had a cloud about, around it and no one could go past it. And you drew near on the day I called you, so the voice is changing a little bit. And here we see the Jews carrying burdens and on the side are the enemy, um, the mouthings and pratings of my adversaries against me all day long. So chapter four is again resigned and it is a third person observation looking at what's going on. It starts again with the word Eicha. How? How is it possible? And the first pasuk says, the gold is dulled, debased, the finest gold. The precious children of Zion, once valued as golden, are accounted as earthen pots. And you can imagine that these figures in the lineup once were straight and tall, and now they're bent over. They're colorless because they cannot work in freedom in the sun. And it describes how everything that was fine and rich is degraded. It describes the streets, the wealthy going through, the garbage, the stench, the stench of um, the streets. Leo Haas was born in 1909. He was in Theresienstadt and was arrested in 1939 for helping German communists to cross the border illegally. And he was sent to forced labor. In September 1942, he was taken from forced labor to Theresienstadt. And he was there until 1944. Uh, like the other artists, some of the other artists, they were accused of smuggling their artworks out of the ghetto, and he was deported to Auschwitz. From Auschwitz, he went to Sachsenhausen, and he was forced to counterfeit foreign currency, um, and he was liberated from Matthausen. After the war, he retrieved about 400 of his drawings and paintings from the ghetto. And he and his wife adopted Tommy, Bedrich Frita's son. And um, so that was Leo Haas, quite an exceptional person and as the others, an exceptional artist. And here's another drawing. Um, her chosen were whiter than milk. Now her faces are blacker than soot. So here in chapter four, 
It says the kings of the earth did not believe that foe or adversary could enter the gates of Jerusalem. And yeah, they thought that Jerusalem would be safe. Everybody thought so. They didn't believe it would be overtaken. But we go now to the next generation. And chapter 5 begins with the word Zahor, remember. And there isn't an acrostic in this chapter. Jeremiah's voice, the voice that's in this chapter, is the next generation. So they are talking more freely and looking at what has happened and what they have lost. We have become orphans. Our mothers are like widows. And this is another woodcut by Miklos Adler. Miklos Adler, um, when he was 36, he was liberated and he survived. He made 16 woodcuts. His, he wanted to make 16 woodcuts to document his memories of the Shoah. They were taken, eight of the, these uh, woodcuts, he made an edition of 500 woodcuts. He went back to where he was born and then later made Aliyah and died in Israel in, I think, 1965. But his woodcuts were found and eight of them were used in a Haggadah that was put together by a man named uh, Dov Shainson. It was used, it was written by memory and by thought. So there is Yiddish and there is Hebrew and there is things that are written like Dayenu. It's not the traditional Dayenu that we have. It's a Dayenu that goes through the horrible things. If we had lost our jobs, Dayenu, it would have been enough. If we had uh, had to lose our homes, Dayenu, it would have been enough. If we had been moved to a ghetto, Dayenu, it would have been enough. And it goes through over and over and over again, all of the terrible things that happened. And you see on the top left, Kol dor vador chayav adam lirot et atzmo ki'ilu hu yatsam emisraim. Everybody has to look each generation has to look as if they themselves escaped Mitzrayim. And there are the workers working like the slaves in Mitzrayim in Egypt worked. And that's another woodcut by Miklos Adler. On the hand drawings on the side, you see Egypt in the top of the bet. And at the bottom, the walls, the barbed wire fences of the camps. And at the bottom is um, of what it says in Yiddish. And it translates as, there is no bad and good exile. Every exile leads to decline. With blood from our hearts, with the light of our belief, and with the last hope, we will break through every wall, break through and make Aliyah. So this is the Haggadah that was used in 1946 in Munich at the first Pesach Seder after the liberation. The people who attended were survivors and Jewish soldiers who had liberated them and fought for them. Interestingly enough, Miklos Adler never knew that this Haggadah existed. And he died in 1965 and had no idea. But his daughter found out. Anyways, this um, amazing Haggadah is available now. Um, you can get it through the Holocaust Museum in the States and probably other places as well. And it's called A Survivor's Haggadah. So going on, 
another of the images that are used in the Haggadah. We must pay to drink our own water and our wood is sold to us. And as we look at it, as I look at it, it reminds me of how throughout history, when things were stolen from the Jews, the Jews were forced, if they wanted anything, to buy it back. When Jewish stores were ransacked and windows broken, the Jews had to clean it up and pay for the damage. And when the synagogues were burnt down, the Jews had to clean it up and pay for the damage. And here it says in Echa, in Lamentations, from a thousand years before, two thousand years before, we must pay to drink our own water and our wood is sold to us. And it says youths must stagger under loads of wood. And here's a picture of youths staggering under loads of wood. The last lines of Lamentations are, Why have you forgotten us entirely? Take us back, O Lord, to yourself, and let us come back. Renew our days of old. And in Hebrew, when we turn the Torah to the ark at synagogue, we say, Chadesh yamenu kekedem v'nashuva hashivenu Adonai elecha. And it's from Lamentations. So on, as I have mentioned, on Tisha B'Av, we read two Haftarot, one in the morning and one at night. And the, I decided to do the morning Haftarah, the words of Jeremiah, and use the term, Oh, that my head were waters and my eyes a fountain of tears, that I might weep night and day for the slain of my daughter, of my people. And here, I use that image from Miklos Adler as my inspiration. And you can see written at the top, Lech Lecha El Haaretz. So Miklos Adler's thought was that whoever survives should make their way to Israel, just as Avraham was told, Lech Lecha, go to Israel. And the Haftorah that's read at Mincha in the evening, as the rain or snow drops from heaven and doesn't return to there, but soaks the earth and makes it bring forth vegetation yielding seed for sowing and bread for eating. That's from the book of Isaiah. And I did a golden drop. And the drop can be a teardrop, or it can be a drop of dew for renewal or it can be a flame, a flame of hope, a flame of memory. So here Isaiah is encouraging us that as the snow, as the rain or snow drops from heaven and doesn't return, but soaks the earth and makes it bring forth vegetation. We remember the destructions of our first and second temples and all the way through history, today, we break a glass at every wedding to bring back that memory, to remember Tisha B'Av, to remember the loss. Many houses have a piece of wall that is not finished and is not painted to they make us think of the unfinished and broken temple. So it is a day dedicated to the memories of destruction and the expulsion of the Jews. Our fasting and contemplation help us find ethical behavior within us as Jews and positive unity as a people going forward. And in this Haftorah from Isaiah, it says, I will give them in my house and, with my mo and within my walls a monument and a name, Yad Vashem, the name of the museum that's dedicated to Holocaust Memorial. So may we have a meaningful Tisha B'Av and may we use our eyes to look and measure 
and understand and not use our mouths to yell and destroy. So thank you. And if you have any questions, please, I'd be, I would love to answer them. Thank you very much, Leah. I think uh, comparing to the Holocaust gives us a different outlook on the text. And I actually wanted to ask you a question about the text, since a lot of the text of Echa is really very difficult to understand. And I was wondering what kind of help you used for you to get to your own artistic interpretations of the text. I uh, listened to a number of shiurim and or study classes and read a lot of texts by a number of different uh, writers and commentators. And it really gave me very interesting insights to it. So when I went back and read it for myself, it opened the text to me and allowed me to look at it in new ways. You know, we have here um, an audience from all over the world, and I think as Jews, uh, we're used to um, comparing our tragedies like Tisha B'Av uh, to the Holocaust. Have you encountered in your research about art um, referring to different kind of tragedies that happen to different people in the world? Well, I did include some of them. So for instance, there's the Bird's Head Haggadah, that's Southern Germany, medieval times referring to the uh, crusaders who were going through and at that time the crusaders when jews were in villages they could hear the sometimes hear the crusaders coming and they would run into the woods and if they didn't run into the woods that's when they were uh, forced to decide if they were going to live or die by their own hand and then the uh, woodcuts that are in the um, Haggadot, those refer to the blood libels from throughout history. So there isn't as much art that I came across to do with um, that kind of destruction. And because I was so inspired by the survivor's Haggadah, with the artwork by Miklos Adler, it really allowed me to realize that that work from the Holocaust, there was so much of it. Not all of it survived, but a lot of it did. And one can almost go through and find an image for every single pasuk, every single verse in Echa. So quite incredible. And a lot of those works are on exhibit in the um, museum at Theretzenstadt. There is an amazing museum that shows the works of the artists, um, both not just visual artists, but actors and costume designers and graphic artists and musicians. So there is a whole museum dedicated to that kind of art by the Jews who were in Theretzenstadt. And it's very chilling to see because you know that these people were creating at such a terrible time under such horrible uh, conditions but they didn't allow the light of creativity to leave them. And they, it was saved, but each of those drawings, each of those compositions, each of those musical scores belong to a person who could have created more generations after them. Um, I think we'll take one more question. Um, Joey wants to know if there are other examples of historical illuminations of Echa from Jewish artists. Um, could uh, of Jewish artists? Well, there were there are lots of Jew Jewish artists. There's Ben Shan, who um, 
one of the things he did, he did a lot of, he was an American artist. He was born in Lithuania. He came to America when he was a young boy and studied a lithography, went on to become a human rights uh, advocate through his art. And in his later years, he went back to his uh, Jewish expression and he did amazing work um, based on sometimes on Hallel, sometimes on Lamentations. And there is a beautiful drawing that he did that uh, became a lithograph of a woman crying that is so evocative of Echa. And there are other images he also did. And there um, are many other artists that if you go to the internet and you look up um, art of the Shoah, art of the Holocaust, you'll find a lot of it. Um, and I'm thinking of other artists, many of them Americans. Of course, there's Marc Chagall, who is the quintessential Jewish artist. And we see his work showing joy and sort of magic realism, but also showing the pain of reality. And last bit about Mark Chagall that I'll just mention quickly is that he uh, spent the Shoah in New York. He was taken out of uh, Paris, but as soon as the um, he went back to Paris because that's where he really wanted to live. That's it. <laughs> Thank you very much, Leah, for sharing this with me. And I hope um, this will give us a, a new insight, a new understanding and feeling towards Tisha B'Av. And we'll be here again next week, uh, post Tisha B'Av, uh, to discuss after a lot of consolation. Thank you, Leah, and thank you, everyone, for joining us. Mm -hmm.